Um, I thought I'd start just by asking you both about um, the structure of, of two stories that you talk about at length, uh, the Meek one in your case and uh, at, at the Bay. Um, we're always sort of told in the shorthand, the, the, the quick version of what a short story is, you know, it's a, it's a reveal, there's a, there's a misdirection, you're told one story about a set of characters, you're given one account, and you're led to believe that that version of events or that version of a characterization. And then there's a, then there's a sudden sort of moment of revelation or a reveal or an epiphany, and suddenly you have to retrospectively um, kind of, uh, kind of reevaluate everything. Uh, and that's it. Bish, bash, bosh, done. Um, you've, you've talked to, uh, today about two stories which are, are very different uh, in their structure. At the Bay seems to be a series of kind of, um, kind of rhythms, really, a series of small, uh, small versions of those reveals. Uh, and again, with uh, uh, the meek one, Jane, your story, um, that story sort of seems to have this series of, of different smaller epiphanies or, and, and again shifts um, and I wonder um, kind of what, what, what do you think the, were the writers trying to uh, escape um, the very simple uh, one epiphany uh, story were they, trying to, uh, were they trying to forge something different or was it a kind of a, a novelistic ambition that, that uh, underpinned those particular stories Well, in the case of, in the case of Mansfield, I, I think um, yes, the two stories that form the the, the sort of study in my essay, um, at the bay and daughters of the late colonel, are, are, dif- are very differently structured. Generally, um, Mansfield was really interested in Chekhov's endings, uh, which which looked very radical on the page. And Virginia Woolf, when she first read Chekhov, was really quite taken aback by what she thought was you know. Um, startlingly innovative uh, and she didn't really take to Chekhov at first as many people didn't but Mansfield absolutely felt the, 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 the sort of impact of the endings of Chekhov stories where suddenly life sort of just stops and there's that sense that it is always in motion, always continuous and therefore any neat tidying up of an ending is a false thing. So you can really feel that sort of ending, Chekhov's endings but for me, because Mansfield is a different writer than Chekhov, um, in, in Chekhov there's a sense that meaning is deferred or, or um, sometimes, sometimes there's um, a, a kind of great loss. Well, it depends on the story. But with, in Mansfield, her provisionality is much more abundant. There's something much... Um, She's, she's more celebratory, I think, in her endings than Chekhov. Um, Chekhov is, is just very non-judgmental and just very much holds the world. You know, he observes it beautifully, the absurdity, the pathos, the tragedy, all of that. He gets it all in, but he stands quite back from it. Whereas at the end of a Mansfield story, very often um, there is this perfect moment, this perfectly abundant moment that, that suggests a strange kind of life. Sometimes it's disturbing, as in the end of, of Miss Brill, there's a perfect image. You can almost feel sort of jigsaw puzzle, they're just clicking into place, the, the ending sentence of Miss Brill. Um, or in a story like A Doll's House, again, perfect image, and it just clicks into place and resonates outward with this strange, almost feeling of excess life. That's what Mansfield does that I find quite strange. There's almost a sense of, um, of, of a story not wanting to kind of, you know, um, to have its cover closed. To be clo- it's, it's strangely alive, and we get that at the end of Mansfield. And that is, it, that's her. That's, that's her building on Chekhov, but making it quite different. In terms, briefly, in terms of the two structures of those two stories, the um, daughters, the, uh, daughters of the late colonel, I'll just call it daughters, um, uh, I read you the bit where, it, where we get this, you know, this terrific kind of unseating of, of everything we expected up to that point. But at the end, in spite of the comedy, we realize that Mansfield really loves these characters. She's not in any way laughing at them, as, as some of her reviewers thought. And she was deeply, deeply disheartened that people thought she was sneering at Jug and at Constantia. At the ending, as they sort of begin to sort of loosen the burden of father on them and to sort of put him, lock him back in the wardrobe, um, we, we get these beautiful images. We just go zoom, plunge right into their interior worlds. And like 
um, like Wolf, she, Mansfield really recognized that there are contradictions in every moment, that every moment is not one thing or the other. Moments are imperfect, and feelings and, uh, and impressions get mingled up. So one moment or one event in life is contradictory and messy. And at the end, we go into these beautiful glimpses when one sister imagines herself just stepping out into the open air and the other sister imagines herself sort of bathed in light. Mans feels better with those images than I am. Um, but they, it's freedom, really. That's what we get to the end. We get these beautiful human glimpses of absolute freedom coming near the end of the story, and yet they don't feel neat. Um, and I... I My own feeling um, is that Mansfield came upon those moments, that they're not planned and plotted, that she simply was getting closer and closer to who her characters were from out external events going right into their essences. And Mansfield's beautiful, I think, at delivering the essences. It almost, it's almost as if the essence of something, as in poetry, just flares on the page. And we get those moments with each sister. At the Bay, the other story that Roll mentioned, is a gradual un un unveiling. It's, it begins with a mist over... Um, a, a landscape of a, of a bay in New Zealand that Mansfield knew well. But, and gradually, in each little episode, we have episode upon episode, uh, there's a secret and there's a gradual mislifting, but it doesn't feel as neat as a reveal. Oops. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> um, uh, I, yes, I'm... <laughs> I kind of lost track of the question. Right? It, it was just, it was uh, just a fascination with the, this kind of rhythmic form that uh, um, the, uh, the two writers were exploring in those two stories. And it, yeah. in some ways, uh, the meek one, it feels like a, uh, a short story in that it's it's, uh, it's narrated immediately after the event in a kind of classic short story way. But there are other aspects that aren't very short story like. No, indeed, and I think, I mean, you know, when you talked about that there are maybe sort of reveals or epiphanies, in a way there aren't, because, um, you know, one of the things that's constantly being revealed is that he has to question what he's done and how he's understood it, and even when he thinks that he's finding new meanings in it, um, he's probably wrong. So one gets led deeper and deeper into it. I mean, he or he himself dig digs a deeper and deeper hole for himself, maybe. I mean, it, it's... it's um, I mean, it, it, is a, it is a story of exploration, but it doesn't end with any kind of conclusion at all. And I mean, w uh, you know, when you, when you originally asked the question, and while Alison was talking, I was trying to think of... Um, he, because the, the forms of his short stories really, really vary, and a number of them were written for very specific purposes. Um, from 1873 onwards, he was conducting this wonderful experiment called A Writer's Diary, which was basically journalistic, Um, but which contained short stories, which, and, and, and the short stories within it were often used to illustrate particular points. So there's a, a delightful little story called The Peasant Mary, or Mari, I don't know how you pronounce it, which you probably know, it's a very famous one. Um, it's very, very short, and in that, um, he, he talks about being in Siberia, in prison in Siberia, and hating the, um, the, the peasants, the drunken, idiotic, rough, foul, violent peasants around him, and then suddenly having a memory of being a child on his, on his um, parents' estate and being frightened. He thinks he hears a, wo a wolf in the woods, and he runs out of the woods. He's very young, runs out of the woods, absolutely petrified, and he bumps into the peasant, Mari, who's tilling the field. And the peasant is owned by his parents. The peasant is a chattel. The peasant is... And the peasant comforts him and loves him, just, just says, you know, what's the matter, and, and, and touches his lips. His fingers got earth, or touches his lips and embraces him and makes the boy feel safe. And Dostoevsky uses that moment um, uh, uh, to illuminate that, that, you know, how can he feel hostility to the men around him? Because these men could be peasants like Mari. They could have that gentleness and that, that love inside them. Um, you know, they are not to be hated. They are human beings. But that story, which I first read on its own as a story of, which was an epiphany, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, that's a classic yeah. short story form. Mm -hmm. When you read it in context, he's actually using it as an illustration for how, um, you know, Russia can never be whole until the educated classes embrace the peasantry. And he tries to that, explain that in different ways, and then he decides that the best way to do it is to illustrate it by a story. So the setting of the story actually gives it a rather... I mean, it doesn't take away mm. what the story is on its own, but it, um, 
You know, it informs the story. And, and, and in fact, m most of the stories that I've selected for this that to talk about are in the writer's notebook. So, you know, looking at the context will often give you more um, sense of, of, I suppose, the complicated things that he's doing. The really co I mean, I've strayed away from your question because I, it doesn't quite fit what Dostoevsky was doing, sure, I feel. Sure. Um, you're, you're both, uh, as well as writers, you both t uh, teach occasionally. You teach uh, creative writing. And I, I wonder if I could ask you two sort of slightly separate questions. Um, first, uh, you, Alison. Um, when teaching um, Catherine Mansfield, um, uh, the central kind of skill of Mansfield is this, this, this mesmerizing, slightly absurd image, which sort of often sits right, you know, center stage in a story. Um, and as a writer trying to learn from her, or as a creative writing teacher trying to tell students, you know, what to learn and what to, uh, what to understand and appreciate and maybe, um, maybe not emulate, but uh, acquire in terms of their skills, how do you, how do you teach uh, Mansfield, or how do you how do you um, kind of get to the bottom of those images because they're they're always utterly illogical. Yeah, they're utterly illogical. Um, and I have to confess, I haven't actually taught Mansfield. I haven't. Oops, sorry. I um, yes, I haven't actually taught Mansfield. But in, in I've, you know I've, um, taught many a short story writer. And trying to think about your question. Um, Gosh, it's, it's a, that, that's where gift comes in. Um, you know, that there's a there's a, a, a certain level I think where where you you can really um, work with a student to train their skills of observation. You're always trying to get them to see more closely, to focus. You know, I'm, I'm routinely putting that as people would have put it in my stories early on. Um, you know, focus in the margins, focus, focus. Um, oh, you know, can we see this more clearly? So, so I think out of I think it's out of, um, well, it's out of two things with Mansfield. One, it's that deep, deep commitment to observation um, that she had, which uh, for me runs deeper. I mean, every short story writer has that, but for Mansfield, it runs deeper. As I say, her, her lens is almost telephoto, and it, and it gives quite a strange effect sometimes to even apparently ordinary uh, description in a story. It all has this slightly weird quality while also vividly capturing a landscape, for example. So on the one hand, it's just the absolute dedication to observation. Um, and I think when you commit, there's something weird that happens in the whole imaginative process. You know, you're committed, you're, you're, you're really training yourself to see in some way. Um, but the, the, the thing itself gives back to you in a way you can't quite account for. But I think, I think writers who genuinely write and create big stories um, know that strange things come out of that deep commitment. And Mansfield spoke often about um, writing as an act of possession. That she, she goes back to that routine of, well, often in her diaries and notebooks. Uh, I think I have, do I have a tiny bit? I might, I might, uh, I might have left it back at the, the hotel. Um, she, she talks about, she says, I, I cannot, um, she says, when I, when, I, when I observe a duck, I don't merely, um, I don't merely become the, the spectacle of the duck. I don't, merely, uh, I don't merely disappear into that scene. I become the duck. Uh, and she, she describes this in various scenarios. I become, uh, I become the, uh, the, the bystander standing on the, on the quay watching the ship go. She, she, and she says, until we truly become something, our writing doesn't take on, she calls it the bounding outline of real life. Um, so there's something between Mansfield, between this almost forensic observation of the world, and then something that is completely illogical, but that she's, I suppose, receptive to, where the, the imagination um, becomes this quite wild space, and she gives herself to that, and becomes entirely, entirely absorbed. And I think for anyone who does write a lot, um, you'll probably know that feeling of deep, or, or not just writing, it goes across life in many, many different forms, but deep absorption, um, new revelations and new insights come from that, from that place. And she was very committed to that wild space of the mind, I suppose. 
Does that answer? Absolutely. Um, Jane, I was going to ask you uh, about the fact, uh, we, again, we talked about the one and how it was very, uh, f it, was, it was one point of view, and uh, we can only guess at what uh, the wife was thinking through all these, uh, these events uh, and this story. Um, what, is, what does that enable Dostoevsky, and what does that enable writers generally to, uh, you know, what are the benefits of, of just... Um, uh, just taking on one point of view, which is which is limited and maybe uh, delusional or maybe uh, you know unreliable in the objective sense. Well, the benefits for the writer obviously are that that what you're doing um, immediately is creating a gap and inviting the reader in because the reader inevitably will be thinking, well, what you know, what's the other person thinking? What's the other person in this <coughs> relationship thinking? Um, there's a marvelous story by Raymond Carver, um, which is called. I want to say it's called history, but I don't think it is called history. But um, I bet everyone here reads Raymond Carver, and you'll all know the one. It's the one where the, the man, um, he, he, he claims that his uh, wife, someone purporting to be his wife, has put a letter under his study door. And um, he's very indignant because it's not her handwriting. And it turns out that his wife is leaving him. And he, ha he gives us this very jumbled account of their relationship. And it's perfectly obvious that her story is a totally, totally different one. And she does leave him at the end of the story. Um, and what's amazing for the reader is that you, you, know, you piece it together and gradually you start to sympathize with the wife. And gradually you start to understand that this man uh, is a liar and is um, deluded. And you, you, know, you are forced to... To, to enter the story as the, almost as the other voice. And that's what Dostoevsky's doing in The Meek One as well. Um, so as a, as a, just as a way of writing a story, it's very exciting because you know that you are creating a space for the reader. And I think one of the things about short stories, which is perhaps even a cliche of short story, is that the short story, more than the novel, you know, leaves a space for the reader, leaves a space for the reader to, to imagine and to add and to... Um, you know, to bring themselves to the story. And that's what's very exciting about short story, I think, or one of the things that's very exciting about it. Yeah, there's, there's that, that wonderful sense of aftermath, isn't there? That kind of resonance afterwards. Yeah, yeah, when yeah. But it's still, it, it has, this, again, this kind of ongoing, uncanny life after, that we, where it completes itself in our minds, usually, more so than a novel, probably. Well, more so than a novel, because a novel is more finished. Yes. And a novel, you know, yes. a novel tells you everything you need to know yes. about these people. And a short story leaves a space. And, you know, from the one day or the one action or the one moment in a life, you know, like the, 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 the stone goes into the pond and you're, you know, your mind's doing the ripples. Mm -hmm. Your mind is filling in the rest of the picture. Great image. Um, any questions? Uh, I don't want to uh, hog the, the debate here, so uh, you've all been listening very, very quietly and patiently. Yeah. I was very interested in the comment that uh, short stories have a poetic quality. Is that something I thought so as well? Is, is there more you could explore around that idea? What's poetic about, I'm saying, Mansfield stories? Yes, Man, um, Mansfield, um, early on in her notebooks, well, she's writing lots of poetry. Um, and, and, uh, and that, those tend to be earlier efforts that you'll find scattered amongst uh, the, the various papers of her notebooks. But she spoke, she said, um, when I'm writing prose, I'm always trembling on the brink of poetry. So you're absolutely right. I, and, I, and I think that's a, a fair point for many short story writers, um, that the short story and its compression and its sort of beautiful, well, its selection of detail, whether it's beautiful or ugly, um, uh, is, is certainly much closer to poetry, but also I'm really interested in, in this notion. Well, I love I love a distinction um, that George Surtzi has made, and and he uh, he had an article in the Guardian about a year and a half ago, where he says that the the real the real sort of power of poetry is is in its the way it creates essences on the page. So it take, goes right to the kind of inner life or inner essence or um, you know, uh, the thinginess of, of, of something, the essence, and, and, and brings it alive onto the page. Um, whereas uh, longer fiction, or long fiction, he argues, is more about situation, circumstance, and then testing characters under pressure. So it's more about building a situation and gradual revelation. But poetry does this essence thing. And um, for me, that's uh, that short stories, and particularly Mansfield's st short stories, that's why they're strange to me, is that they do bring in this um, power, I think, 
from poetic form, where, where in many Mansfield stories, uh, the perfect image, image just, it does, it sort of clicks into place, not in a mechanical way, but in an organic way. But with it, something just flares very strangely on the page. And for me, that's part of her, uh, you know, she was hugely well-read um, in poets, yeah. So absolutely, and for me as well, I think, as a writer, it's, I, I, I couldn't begin to quite divorce the two completely. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, because you brought Raymond Carver into the room, I thought I'd ask a question. <laughs> it's about, you know, related to Raymond Carver. It was about the role of the editor, Lillian. <coughs> you know, there was mm-hmm. the, the issue about Raymond Carver's editor and the difference mm, yes, between the editors yes, and the indeed. unedited stories. Yeah. And I didn't know, in your reading, you referred to Mansfield talking about, mm. I'd rather do without the money than have the editor. I wondered if, if anything was known about the role of the editor in the Um, well, it's certainly, um, when Dostoevsky was doing the writer's diary, which the, the, the meek one appeared in, and The Dream of the Ridiculous Man, and Bob Ock, and a number of the other great stories, um, he was actually um, writing and publishing that himself. So he was not beholden to anybody. Um, I'm not aware of him um, being uh, particularly um, edited, but I have to say, you know, I'm really not a Dostoevsky scholar. I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a reader. Um, and it, I mean, I, I, in the earlier work, it, it's possible. I, I, I'm not aware of it, though. Uh, on, on Mansfield, uh, sh- she was, as she describes herself, such a stickler that by the time she then surrendered a story to an editor, um, well, you've, you've had the response, yes, uh, uh, Oh, where is it? Yes, um, oh, I've lost it. But I, I'd rather pluck out, shall I pluck out the eyes of my story for 40 quid? Um, and and that, those little um, sort of remonstrations appear in her notebooks fairly often, just you know, um, if she's had feedback from an editor. Initially, she's, um, she's a little bit um, dubious. But, um, uh, and, and, and then it, it goes through. Sometimes she comes around and sometimes she doesn't. But um, there's not detailed I don't, I don't have I wouldn't know any detailed sort of editings of her stories to look at um, just these notes in her own notebooks um, fairly um, mostly resentful <laughs> I suppose but, but um, she always then makes herself look she, she sort of seems to be slightly resentful at first and then she goes back and seems to have a to, to weigh it up actually if I can add one thing that I do know about um, Dostoevsky when he was working on the writer's notebook which, you know, sets out to be terribly chatty and like a speaking voice just very every day. Actually, um, and I haven't seen these, but apparently it's possible to see um, uh, notebooks where he actually shows how he himself edited his work to make it seem completely informal and completely chatty. So he was an extremely strict... I mean, and again, it's this, you know, this notion that certainly I have had in the past, of Dostoevsky's this great sprawling genius who just lets it all happen, actually no, you know, of course, he's a craftsman. He edits himself Mm -hmm. tightly, particularly, specifically. He makes it precise because he cares about language and he cares about what he's saying. Mm -hmm. There's another question here. I've enjoyed reading stories by both of you two, and I like short stories to be kind of short. And I got a bit of a shock when I went and did the homework They are some of them quite long. Mm-hmm. And this, I mean, the question is really now in the after the short story, how short is short? <laughs> <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> uh, I think you've answered your yes. I think uh, doesn't doesn't matter is the is the good question. I think. Um, Oh, goodness. And, and, and Jane is a far more experienced novelist than I am. So if you're we're trying to think between the forms, um, how should, I, I I suppose. For me as a writer, one of the most important qualities is a kind of intensity. That's what I want from a short story. And, and so for me, that's never stretched or rarely stretched beyond about 8,000 words. Um, Mansfield stories, you're right, do... Uh, uh, at the Bay, gosh, I'll have to go back and look. I believe it's 60 pages. Um, Prelude is, is also very long. Uh, Je ne parle pas français is, is about 40 um, so she does have these long stories that unfold, uh, some of some of which in, in straight episodes or in sort of almost discrete episodes, um, rather than building up through a, a unity of scenes. 
but I think um, she's trying to do different things in different stories. So in a very long story, like At the Bay, she really is trying to create this sense of all of life, all of life contained within, I think it's one day, I should know that, but um, I'd have to think back, one day at the summer colony um, near Wellington. So it's this one day of this family holiday. Um, and it, the notion of sort of creating this whole world is, is out of things is really what she's trying to do in that story. So I understand why she stretched to many episodes, but it's still contained. It's a, it still feels very much like a whole um, yeah, I'm not. It's. It, I think that. I think the thing is is having. Uh, it's. It's. The, it's the sense of compression still that we're getting in that world. Everything distilled, distilled down, and it's not. We don't have plot and subplot. I think that's a very crude answer. But novels often deal with have plot and subplot stitched together, so circumstances multiply. Whereas Mansfield does, even in her longer stories, keep the focus, the frame, tight. Um, it's quite contained, even over 60 pages. It's a woolly answer, I'm afraid. But um, it's a tricky question. It's a good question, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a good question. And I think, I mean, with Dostoevsky, his stories range from, you know, a page and a half to, you know, all the way up to novel length. I mean, you've got a number of very, very long short stories, which, uh, well, I mean, I would say, you know, Notes from the Underground and The Eternal Husband are novellas, basically. Um, and it, I mean, it seems to me that he, you know, he just, he, he wrote to the length that it needed to be. Mm. Um, and and the, the ones which are more like parables or fables or, you know, the, the fantastical ones are very tightly, um, you know, a, a very tight short length and d deliver the, you know, the, the punch or the punchline that they need to deliver. But once you get into more psychological exploration, he gives himself the space to let it grow and grow. Um, and I think... I mean, it's interesting. It seems to me that there are short story writers who do need a longer length as well. Thinking of contemporary writers, William Trevor, um, you know, one of absolutely the greats. I mean, he, w he will write some short stories which are really very short, and he will write, you know, novella length. Um, I mean, it's, it's almost like, well, the material will, if you like, find its length. Um, I, I guess the material will find its fitting length, or the writer will find the fitting length of the material. There isn't, there isn't an, there isn't an ideal answer, though. It, it, it's occasionally very riling when you get these um, short story competitions, and it's you know three thousand words, five thousand words, eight thousand words. Um, you know, and it's very prescriptive. Yeah. And sometimes a story needs to be, you know, bigger, different. Yeah. Of course, Alice Munro's stories again. Yeah. Someone else who has seemingly, seemingly on the page, quite large, um, you know, many pages, yeah. sprawling stories almost. And she describes, in terms of short story structure, she describes the act of writing it's going into a house. And she says, I really could start in any room in that house, which is interesting, because I, 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 I couldn't. Um, you know, I, I, there's a place where I have to begin. Um, I, and I can't sprawl. I need that compression for the intensity, I suppose, I want to give in, in many stories. Anyway. I, there's a few people I need to thank. Uh, firstly, Manchester Literature Festival uh, and uh, Will Carr and the International Anthony Burgess Foundation uh, for hosting this event. Uh, I obviously need to uh, thank the Arts Council as well, which supports everything uh, Comma does and it enables us to promote and discuss and champion and uh, celebrate the short story. Um, and as I say, this is part of a, an ongoing project, the, uh, the anthology of essays, uh, collection of essays, um, morphologies will be published uh, at the uh, sort of mid-November. So uh, do uh, keep an eye on our website. If you'd like to sign up to our mailing list, there's a mailing list sheet at the back. Uh, but uh, I guess it just remains for me now to ask you to join me in thanking uh, two fantastic uh, speakers for tonight's amazing event. Jane Rogers. <laughs>